Hey everybody, this is Sheets, and I'm going to be going over the UFC card for this Saturday, February 18th, uh, from a DraftKings, well, from a, a DFS perspective. Uh, tomorrow, we're going to be doing the MMA betting breakdown, which is uh, significantly different. Um, but today, we're going to attack this UFC fight night, which is a very, very, uh, it's a small card, uh, only 11 fights, presuming this all they, they all they all go as scheduled. And... It's probably a pretty lousy card for MME GPP play um, for a number of reasons. Number one, well, I mean, whenever you only have 11 fights, it's it's a little less exciting because there's just so many fewer, so much, so many fewer combinations of fighters that it's harder to kind of, you know, get that big optimal $100,000, you know, prize. It's just much more likely that you're going to be chopping it with a whole bunch of people. Um, the, the other thing that makes this card not particularly intriguing is, well, the fact that the main event is just extremely difficult to think. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll get into that rather shortly. I guess what does make it somewhat interesting is that there's a lot of, I don't want to say a lot of unknowns because there's only 11 fights, but there, there's, there's, there's a decent amount of variance with this, um, with this card. And it, it does actually lead me to this observation before we get into this. And it's, again, something for you to consider. Whenever you have uh, unknown fighters, guys with kind of you know fishy records, guys that we haven't seen before, and these lines come out, everybody sort of agrees that there's quite a bit of variance in, in the line. And as a result, quite a bit of variance in the props. And as a result, quite a bit of variance in the projections but what people don't consider is that the the variance goes both ways so if someone comes out as say a minus 200 favorite there are, and and let's just say people think well, we're not sure what's going on here a lot of people say well i'm just gonna not gonna lay the minus 200 that just doesn't make any sense because there's way too much variance they, they presume that all the variance is on the favorite side in other words they, they can't make room for the possibility that instead of a minus 200 favorite probably being closer to pick them, that maybe the minus 200 favorite is, is actually more likely to be minus 400. Um, and that that's actually somewhat interesting. Um, I, so you could argue that in GPPs, well, in betting also, but specifically in GPPs and, and, and everything, the favorites in these unknown fights might actually carry with them more actual GPP value than the underdogs because everybody, not everybody, but I think most people's natural inclination is to not believe the unknown as a minus 300 favorite and probably play a little more of the underdog or not play as much of that minus 300 guy they haven't heard of where it's possible that that minus 300 is, maybe more like a minus 600 and maybe you should play more of it. So that that's something to consider as you have kind of fight cards like this. The other thing though, that uh, I think we can agree on is that in on fight cards with a lot of unknowns, that that dynamic is actually really good for GPPs. Okay. Because the, the, when the lines are kind of fishy and the, as, as a result, the props are sort of fishy then the projections are sort of fishy. So that becomes kind of a good GPP situation. And you could probably go for low ownership. You don't actually have to believe the projections as much um, as when you're fighting, uh, when you deal with fights of guys that we've seen a hundred times. When, when you have fights like this, like like Clayton Carpenter, Juan's Camilo Ronderos. I mean, no, but nobody's really seen these guys fight. Um, I mean, yes, people have watched some tape and, a lot of anecdotal evidence of some of these guys, but to really come up with a good line for this is basically guessing, you know, and, and as a result, not only that, but I'm not using this fight. I mean, this fight's just an example, but I mean, how do we really know if a guy has fought twice in, in has two fights of tape, whether they're a wrestler or, or, or a, or a striker. I mean, and people, what they do is they, they rely on one tape or one fight and then they basically conclude how a, how a fighter is supposed to fight, and 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 it's um, 
it does provide for quite a bit of variance. Right? So let's kind of go through these fights and uh, we'll, we'll just see what we come up. But I do think there are some key fights you sort of have to get right. And I'll give you a couple of takes along the way. Um, I don't see any real gross misprices, first of all. There's not any there's not any fighter that is is just, you know, should be that's a minus 300 that had a lot of line movement or something like that. I think that from a, a you know, uh, money line perspective, everybody's sort of fair. You could argue that maybe Aaron Blanchfield might be might have a little bit of line value. And we're going to get to that in a minute. Um, but. I think overall, everybody's kind of fair. But we'll go through this. So Clayton Carpenter is minus 300. Um, with Vig, it's probably minus 270. So he probably should be like 9,200 or so. Um, and you look at the at the price of this guy, it's 9,300 to 6,900. Seems about right. Um, now, with a $9,300 fighter, though, uh, if, if you want to get the put him in the optimal, now, again, We'll get back to that in a second, but remember an 11 fight card, it's not as important to get like huge ceilings of everybody. You know, if you could get six of six winners, it's kind of pretty good. You know, it went up with only 11 fights to choose from. So don't get too crazy about just taking wild underdog shots. I mean, if you could somehow get six, you know, six guys to win, don't worry too much about the upside of the underdog. That's, that's my, that's another comment on this, on this card. In, a, in any case, Carpenter for 9,300, what you're looking for is an inside the distance prop of about uh, minus 110 or so to finish. Um, and if he also has some grappling upside, that would actually be be pretty helpful. Um, and according to this, we have um, Carpenter inside the distance minus 115 or maybe even a little higher. So he... He fits the bill. Now, as far as whether he can wrestle or not, we're really just honestly guessing. I mean, like, you know, I've heard that he has some grappling. I've seen that Ronderos is maybe not the greatest grappler in the world, so it's possible the Carpenter has has grappling upside too. So we really don't know. I, I think that overall, I think it's a very reasonable play. Um, you could you could you deal with the eye test a little bit. Ronderos in his last fight, he took on short notice against Dvorak and he was just not competitive. He didn't look, you know, in shape. He didn't look anything. And then he tested positive for weed and cocaine and then took time off. I mean, this was, you know, this is not a guy you probably want to get behind in general. And you don't really want to play plus 300s unless you really have to. Um, and unless Ronderos himself has a really good inside of distance problem, maybe I would say you got to have a, like plus 400 or something like that. You really don't want to play him. And his inside the distance prop is really poor. So I think that Carpenter's obviously a really good favorite. Um, and Rondaros is someone I'm probably going to have zero. Fletcher against uh, Garimbo. Uh, this is a guy we've seen before a couple of times. And these guys are really strange. These guys that, that, that look good in losses. Um, he came out in his first fight against Matthew Semmelsberger as a pretty big underdog, and he ended up um, – and he put on a really good performance, then he lost. Then he came out as a really, like, really top DraftKings play that everybody was playing against, Lusa. And he, you know, he got after it, and he almost finished him. Then he kind of ran out of gas, and then he just got beat up a little bit, and he lost. So you have two – Two fights, one of which, you know, you can make an excuse for. He was a, you know, a, uh, whatchamacallit, uh, a short notice replacement or whatever it is, and he was competitive. And the second fight, I think that might have been in Utah or something. Not Utah, but I think it was it was, it was altitude. Is that a reason to, to excuse him? Well, I mean, the other guy had altitude also, but um. In any case, he's a minus 260 favorite. He should probably be about 9K or so. And I believe he is. Um, 9,100. So what you're looking for 9,100 is, again, uh, probably about even money to finish inside the distance or um, or a decent amount of grappling upside. 
And Fletcher is a good combination of both sort of. He's not exactly minus 110 inside the distance. He's like plus 100, you know, plus 105. But he's got a lot of wrestling upside. So I consider him just about the same as Carpenter. The Garimbo uh, does carry a little bit of variance. I mean, that that matters, but it's inside the distance prop is just so poor. I mean, plus 500. I just, I just can't get it done. Um, is it enough that he's plus 240 to win? That That's that's the one thing. I'll, I will say this. I would rather play Garimbo than Ronderos because in the absence of a good inside the distance prop, I mean, you just want the guy with the best winning chances. So if you have to play underdogs, um, Garimbo is fine. The other thing I would say also is that Fletcher, I think, is going to be more popular than Carpenter. Um, currently, I have Fletcher at 32% and Carpenter 28 And because everybody's seen Fletcher before, he, I think they're really more likely to play him. And because he has that wrestling floor, people are more likely to play him than a 6-0 and Carpenter that they have, nobody knows about. So I think that Garimbo in GPPs is probably a decent underdog just for his win odds, just because he's plus 240, which means that he's going to win the fight about, you know, 30% of the time. And 30% of the time at that price is not bad on 11 fights slate. So um, we got, we'll, we'll use him as our, in our underdog pool. Philip Linz versus Ovin St. Pru. You have Linz is minus 200. So we're expecting to see maybe 8,900 or 8,800 or something like that. And the comeback about 73. And it's about right. Linz 88, St. Pru 74. Um Take a look at the inside the distance props here. You have two guys that are, I mean, are probably just going to, there's two 37-year-old dudes that are probably not going to be very active and probably not a fight you want to go near. But, you know, 11 fights, you can't be that picky. Let's look at the inside the distance props. You have you have St. Pru plus 400, 420. That price, I don't know. Uh, I don't think that's for me. Lynn's inside the distance plus 180 or so, you know, accounting for the VIG. That's pretty poor, honestly. He does have some wrestling upside, I guess. But I don't know. I really consider this this fight pretty, pretty fadeable. Um, you know, and listen, uh, MME 150 lines, you probably have to get some of it, but but I think this is this is one of those fights where neither guy really looks that great. So we're going to move on. Uh, Askabob against Emmers. So Askabob is a minus 140s favorite. He should be about <clears throat> 8,400, something like that. Take a look. And what do we have? Yeah, 8,300, 7,900 makes sense. And this is a weird one because... You have this guy, Ashkabob, who's 23 and 0. And the problem is, among other things, he hasn't fought in three years or two, three years, and he hasn't really fought anybody. So is it a total fraud, totally fraudulent 23 and 0? Maybe. Um, we, we really just don't know. Um, Emmers, uh, he's been around, uh, you know, UFC. He's had some decent performances. He had a really good first round or two against uh round, I guess, against Pat Sabatini. Um, and then he just kind of got in a grappling exchange, which uh was not very smart and got submitted. Then they really hurt his leg as well. Um I do think that Emmer is, is gonna end up being a, a sort of popular underdog here. Um I have him at 27% owned, and it's a name people know, and the other guy is off three years uh, and, and maybe a fraudulent record. So he's going to be kind of popular, but let, let's see what the, what the, first of all, let's look at these inside the distance props. So first of all, Ashkabob, is he a grappler? I, you know, he's got a Russian sounding name, <laughs> so, but, but they don't really, they don't really say, I mean, there's not a lot of real good tape on him. I, from the tape that I've seen, it just looks kind of average. You want to know the truth. So let's take a look at the inside the distance props here. You have Ashkabov inside the distance is plus 240. I mean, it's not the worst. Um, Emmer's inside the distance plus like 
what is this? It costs like 375. At that price, I mean, that's it's just kind of weak, you know. But but have we seen any underdog that's that's good yet? I mean, we'll we'll include Ashkabov. I mean, Emmer's in our underdog pool just for win odds, but but it's not like a huge priority given his, you know, for the inside the distance prop. So I think this fight's just kind of okay. I'm not gonna take a big stand on this one. And um, he's just uh, I guess because of the pricing, you probably want to go after it a little bit, but I'm not expecting huge results from a fantasy perspective in this, in this fight. Nazim Sadikov versus Evan Elder. Um, so another minus 200 or so, minus 180. I'm expecting about an 8,800 or something like that um, for Sadikov. Let's take a look. Sadikov is... We'll get back. To, I guess we'll get back to Buena Silva. Sadikov eighty six hundred. Maybe he's a little cheap, um, but not really. So there's no real line value there. And and interestingly, from a style perspective, you would think that the Sadikov would be the rest the, the wrestler and Elder would be the striker. But it's actually the reverse. If there's anybody that's going to get takedowns, it would be Elder. Um, so I guess you could argue before you get into the inside the distance prop that Elder might have some wrestling upside. In other words, in his decision wins, he might score okay. Um, let's take a look at the inside of distance part. Maybe we can find something. I mean, even if you get plus 200 for Sadikov, I mean, that would be what we kind of want. Actually, this isn't bad. Sadikov plus 200 inside the distance, I think is very reasonable. Um, so that's not bad. And then you have Elder inside of this plus 400. I don't like that. He does have a little bit of wrestling upside, though. So I would say that this fight's actually better than I first thought. And I like I like this plus 200 uh, inside the distance prop for Sadikov. You compare that, for example, to, to Philip Linz. Linz inside the distance is a plus. Actually, this isn't bad either. So I guess they're the same. Linz like plus 210. Sadikov plus like I guess it's pretty much the same. So I'm back to I'm back to thinking it's like just kind of okay. Oh hold on a second. Eric Haber. Sorry about that. So I don't know where I left off, but uh yeah, I uh so uh Sadikov and Elder uh um did we look at that? Yeah, so I think it's pretty very similar to the to the Linz fight, just kind of okay. Maria Buena Silva versus Leah Landsberg. We have a minus five million favorite, um, minus five hundred or whatever it is. She should be should be like ninety like ninety four hundred, ninety three hundred. That's what these these fighters get priced at, and she is um, ninety five hundred. But the problem is at ninety five hundred. I mean, you need. You need a big number to pay off 9,500. Now, typically, that involves either a first round KO or a second round KO plus incredible grappling upside with takedowns and all that stuff. Um, preferably both. Preferably, you want a KO in the first round, either in the first minute, or if it's going to last the first minute, more than the first minute better come with a bunch of takedowns otherwise you're going to have 100 points which is not might not be good enough at 9500 and especially on a card like this where the, the underdogs look kind of fishy you know if you play the 9500 you're forced into these underdogs that are going to look fishy um so when you look at the inside the distance prop on buena silva you're not going to be particularly impressed here you know you, you have her fight doesn't go to decision line of, I mean, it's plus 170 or so, or plus 160. And that's extremely poor for this price. And it, unless she can make that up with a ton of takedowns, it's just no good. And, and the problem is, is that she's literally had no takedowns. I mean, she's had one takedown in the UFC. So it just, I know it's tough to give up a minus 500 favorite 
on an 11 fight card, but it's just an extremely poor GPP play. Um, and I guess I will just leave it at that. And Lena Landsberg, uh, she's just, just her win odds are just not good enough. Um, you can't, you just can't bet these plus 400s unless like all of her wins are by KO, which they're not. So, um, I wonder though, like if, if Landsberg wins at 6,900 and gets like 60 points, 65 points in a decision, maybe that is good enough. Is, can I put her in like these Ronderos, you know, Garimbo? I mean, maybe even the Ronderos, you know what I mean? Maybe, maybe on an 11 fight card, you could just take this win, these win odds down here. You're not really competing against these huge underdog upside plays. We'll get to maybe one in a minute, but um, so this fight's again a kind of a struggle to kind of get to. Uh, Jim Miller, Alex Hernandez is not one that's difficult to get to. So this is this is one you probably have to play. Um, you have Alex Hernandez minus two fifty, so he's going to be probably about you know eighty eight hundred something like that, and and. What's his name? Miller, probably 74. And pretty close, 89, uh, 89 to 7,300. And for this to work, you need, for the favorite, for openers, you want, I mean, maybe plus 115, 120 inside the distance works. Uh, if if not, some wrestling. And if you look at him, I mean, he's just, he's just perfect. I mean, not only is he almost, you know, uh, 110 inside the distance. He's plus 105. This is kind of what you want. Not only that, he also has wrestling. So this is an extremely strong play. Um, so I think he's so far the best overall play on the board. Uh, and yet, on the other hand, you have Jim Miller, who at 7,300, this is finally you get like a little bit of upside here. You have Miller inside the distance is plus like 320. And plus 320 for that price is very reasonable. Um it's the closest thing we've come to 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 a good price. Like you look at, you compare him to, I don't know, some of these others. Let's compare him to Saint Pru, for example. Saint Pru inside the distance, like plus four hundred. You know that that that's a big difference here. Um, let's look at Garimbo. Garimbo was plus, you know, four seventy five. So let's even let's look at. Elder was a wrestler. It was a little hard to, 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 to tell, but what was even Emmer's? Like Emmer's was, it was going to be pretty popular. Emmer's was uh, plus 310 or something like that. So, you know, Jim Miller is a very, very strong underdog play. So in total, this fight is probably, well, we'll get to the main in a minute. Maybe we'll get to a couple others, but this is the fight that you probably want to make sure you have. Um, if you play more than one lineup, you want to play one Alex Hernandez or one Jim Miller. And then if you play more than that, you probably want to break it up. This would be the fight uh, of the non-main event fights. We'll get to that in a minute, where you probably want to make sure you have this. Um, Marcin Prachnow against William Knight. Uh, it's minus 110 either way. You're expecting it to be like 8,100, 8,100, and it pretty much is. 8,200, 8, same thing. Um Take a look at the inside the distance prop. What you're looking for here is probably plus two fifty ish, either way. Um, I think I think you're gonna get it. Uh, William Knight inside the distance is plus two twenty, which is perfectly reasonable. And then you have Pratch now inside the distance, which is a little worse, like plus two forty. But I think both these guys are very reasonable. So so I I think that this is. This is another fight that if you had to, you know, make sure you take it, you take some of, it would be this one. Now, Pratchett doesn't really have the same finishing upside that William Knight does, but um, again, it's good enough to 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 make I don't say priority, but it's definitely in your main build of of, of lineups, right? Is is this fight? And William Knight also has some wrestling upside to go with that um, the Kale upside. So I think William Knight actually becomes a much stronger play than, than Pratch now. Um, the only thing is, is with the ownership, 
actually, I see Knight being owned less than Prachnyo some reason for some reason. So um, I definitely like Knight here now that I talk through this. It's it, listen, it's a awful looking fight. I mean, you'll see him. He's like a huge mountain of a man. And then you see him will get taken down or will get kicked. And he's just not, it doesn't look like much of an MMA guy. He looks more like a bodybuilder who's, who's fighting people. But uh, we'll see. Uh, I definitely think this fight, you know, because of this pricing, uh, the incentive distance prop is not that bad. I think it's something you probably should get involved in. Um, Jamal Pogue versus Josh Parisian, like big heavyweights. One guy we haven't seen before. One guy we have, and he hasn't looked very good. You have Pogue is minus 240 or so, and he is, so he should probably be again about a 9K, something like that. Um, I think that's what we're getting. Yep, 9K exactly. So again, for a 9K fighter, you really need either a big wrestling upside or minus 110 or so inside the distance. And unfortunately, the inside the distance prop is, is sort of poor. You know, Pogue is like plus 180 or so, even worse, inside the distance. He does have some theoretical wrestling upside. It depends on who you ask. In other words, it depends on what fight you're looking at. Like, he 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 fought a couple of fights ago and got like seven takedowns. And then, as a result, really gassed out. And then his last fight, he played had a nice, easy time of it striking. So, if I mean, I don't know what goes through these guys' heads, but if it were me and I was Jamal Pogue, right, let's take a look at this again. I didn't even say here, but if I was Jamal Pogue and two fights ago, I gassed out from seven takedowns. And then his last fight, I, I you know, you, I would win it just, just striking and like leave with no damage in a tuxedo. That's the way, that's the thing, that's the fight I would try. So um, I think that Pogue is probably bad at 9K. Um, I think his his path to victory is kind of a boring striking affair, which basically sucks all the fantasy points out of the out of the world. Um, Parisian, let's take a look at his inside the distance. Probably you'd think a heavyweight would be okay at 7K, but his inside the distance prop is like a billion. I mean, look at some of these numbers. I mean, it's, well, hold on a minute. No, it's like plus 600. And you'd like to think that he doesn't have a lot of takedown upside if the other guy had seven takedowns, you know? So I think maybe they'll try for a takedown or two, but I think they end up just a, kind of a boring striking affair. So this fight's probably a pass for me. Um, Jordan Wright against Zach Pagwa. So... We have minus 270 is the co-main event, minus 270 and plus 225. So we're expecting, again, like 9K, something like that, 9K, 7,200. We'll take a look and see what the odds actually are. And that's pretty close, 92, 7K. Um, and for a 9,200 fighter, again, what we're looking for is, is inside a distance prop about pick em or wrestling upside. And it uh, really fits the bill. You have Pagua is minus actually minus 150 i mean he's got the best inside the distance prop of anybody on the slate so it's kind of hard to say to not play him uh so i guess i changed my mind i, I guess that he's probably a is he a better play than hernandez uh maybe you know but hernandez does have that wrestling upside um is he a better play than carpenter it just it, or Fletcher, it just depends on, on, on how much wrestling Carpenter does. Fletcher, is he a better play than Fletcher? He's probably probably a better play than Fletcher. At least he's, he's close. I mean, at least he's, he's either tied or a little bit better. So I think Pog was very reasonable here. Listen, there's a lot of a lot of variance in this line. I mean, you haven't really seen too much of him. And his last fight, he got KO'd. Um, so who knows? Jordan Wright. Uh, he has been on these cards quite a bit and, and he always uh, does get a bit of ownership because he doesn't like, he doesn't really get out of the first round or two. He, um, and it's interesting to say it that way, right? Um, why, why would he get all this ownership if he doesn't get out of the first round or two? Because you have to consider what would happen if he actually won, right? So he's plus 250 to win. 
or so. So that means about 30% of the time he wins. And I think it's safe to say that on a card like this, when he wins, he's going to, he's just going to be in the optimum. You know, you look at his inside the distance prop, you have right inside the distance is going to be, uh, where is this? Right inside the distance is, it's like plus 300 or so, you know, at 7K. And he's got a better, he's got the best inside the distance prop of all these underdogs, like by a lot. You know, you go back to the Jim Miller, even like the Jim Miller, he's was plus inside the distance. He he was plus three, 320 or something, but he was 300, $300 uh, uh, higher. Um, so at the very, at the very worst, I mean, he's right as on par with Jim Miller as, as a good underdog. Now, listen, the other thing I will tell you is that, is that Jordan Wright has literally never come through in these spots. The only time he's ever won uh, in the where we've been able to bet on him really is against Jamie Pickett, who is just, I mean, he's just kind of knowing the DFS community is just kind of the worst. Um, and he was a pick him in that fight. Every every time he's come in as this big underdog that people have said he has all this upside and he's supposed to like just bet him. He just is not even remotely competitive. Um, although I shouldn't say that. And, and his last fight, he was he won the first round, and then he just just gassed out. So it just it feels like you're just continuing to throw money away on this guy. He just literally never does it. He just always like gets gets, gets ownership um, because of that win condition, uh, and he's just never he's just never been competitive. However, you, you just kind of have to keep doing it. You know, whenever you I mean, he's got a inside the distance prop where if he comes in, if the thirty percent of the time that he wins. If it happens, I mean, is it 30%? Yeah, then then he's just going to be optimal. That's just the way it's going to be. So you just kind of have to play. Um, so this is a fight. You're probably going to have to get both sides. So you have to get both sides of this one. You have to get both sides of the Hernandez-Miller fight. Probably both sides of the Pratchnow night fight. And then you're kind of pick some of these favorites and you're off to the races. Now, main event. The unfortunate reality is that, well, I mean, fortunate or unfortunately, it's it's a really, really good fight. And the way the styles kind of line up for this, it's going to be extremely difficult for the winner to not be in the optimum. Um, you have a five round fight with uh, Jessica Andrade, who is completely dependent on striking. Well, actually completely, but dependent on striking and volume and KO upside. And when you have a striker, who's dependent on volume and, and KO upside, the five rounds just is just so huge, okay? Because in those variations where she doesn't get the KO, she has five rounds to pile up the volume. And in her last fight, in three rounds, she just piled up the volume. So she's a, a high-volume striker with KO upside at 8,500. I mean, when she wins, I mean, she's going to be in the optimal – Okay, I'm not going to say every time. So let's talk about this for a second. If she wins a second round KO, I mean, how is she not? I mean, that what's she going to get? Ninety? Maybe she doesn't get there in a third, in a second or third round KO. But the way it works with her is, as the KO bonus increase uh, decreases, her volume is just piled up over the course of rounds. Um, the other way that she could win. And, and not be optimal. There are a couple of ways. So if Blanchfield gets like a bunch of takedowns and, 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 you know, two of the rounds, she controls Andrade and three of the rounds, she doesn't, then maybe Andrade in a decision won't get enough volume to make it work. So I guess you could make that argument that not every one of Andrade wins is, is comes in the optimal. And look, uh, what's his name? Hernandez can smash. Um, what's his name? Uh, Pagua could smash. Cl Carpenter could smash. Fletcher. So all these guys could outscore Andrade by a decent amount um, and make her not optimal. And she's going to be like 50% or 40% on. The, 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 the side of this, which is more difficult to fade, is, is Blanchfield. Okay. Because Blanchfield's entire win condition is DraftKings gold. Okay. So she 
for her to win this fight, and if you look at the odds, she's going to win the fight about 45% of the time, right? For her to win this fight, she needs to, to get, I don't know, what, what's 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 the minimum? Five, five takedowns? You know what I mean? Like three, four, four takedowns plus control time? Because remember, it's not enough to just get the takedowns. If you're going to get the decision win, the, the 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 judges need more than that. They they want ground and pound. They want some control time. They want a lot. Okay, it's not just you know smut, you know get a takedown and uh, that, that's enough to get a decision. You've got to do better than that. So if in fact she does get the decision, it's going to not just be because she gets a takedown here and there. It's going to be because she does a lot with them. Um, and the, the so so she is just an extremely strong play. Um, the other thing, which should really not go unnoticed, is that she could get there in a loss. You know, like like she could she could get a couple of takedowns, you know, get some control time, and then the judges just don't like her. You know what I mean? The judges prefer a striker. Or she could get like this. This is definitely possible. She can get multiple takedowns in the first round, multiple takedowns in the second round be piling up the points and then get KO'd, you know? And she could still get there in a loss. This fight is reminding me a lot, although the styles were reversed, of last week's fight between Volkanovski and uh, Makachev. And even though the styles are exactly the opposite, um, we had we had Volkanovski, who was the striker, was the big underdog, and Makachev is the big favorite. My, my point was, going when I was analyzing it, was that while I didn't think it was 100%, 100% likely, not 100% like I didn't think it was 100% sure that Makachev's win would be enough to put him in the optimal. I did think that Volkanovski's wins would all, always put him in the optimal. And it came true to such an extent that he even lost and he was in the optimal. And he didn't even get that many points in his loss. And he got like 60 points um, because he got a bunch of, bunch of, you know, a bunch of strikes in there. In in Blanchfield's losses, she she could, right? If this fight goes to decision, Blanchfield could have some variations where she gets there at sixty points or even more, you know. So, like it or not, Blanchfield is just kind of a theoretical lock. I think um, if you're gonna fight anybody, if you're gonna fade anybody on this card in the main event, it would be Andraj for all the reasons I just described. But if you're playing cash or something like that, I think you could actually play both of them. Part of me also want, I keep thinking to do this, then I just realized it's not a good idea. Part of me wants to throw just a couple of lineups in with both of them in GPPs. And just because I just see these, I see the way these scores are going to come in. You know, we're going to get like, Blanchfield with takedowns, Andrade piling up the points, the, the, the volume. Five rounds of this. You don't you don't think it's possible that you could get Andrade with 90 in a win and Blanchfield with 65 in a loss? No other underdogs come in and you're a genius. I mean, I think I, I you know, I think I might do it just for just for fun. I think I might. I think I might play a couple, and it's probably just an atrocious idea, but I think I might do it. I just, just the, the, the dynamic of, of that is just something on an eleven fight slate. I don't want to. I don't want to avoid. Or I don't want to dismiss. So uh, that's pretty much will do it for the uh, breakdown from a DFS perspective. Tomorrow we're going to do a breakdown from a uh, from a betting perspective, which is honestly more, much more fun, um, and uh, we will get to that then. Uh, till then, good luck, everybody.